Another area of physics that we can study is the study of waves, and musical instruments totally rely on waves to make the music that they create. And musical instruments often fall within two categories. One would be strings, where the, there's vibrations occurring on a string, or tubes, like the flute and the organ here, that have air vibrations inside of tubes. And there's also percussions and stuff, and we will look at that as well. But the two main areas are called transverse waves and longitudinal waves. This is a neat demonstration device, and it has metal rods, uh, lots of them, that are soldered to a very springy wire. So when I twist this rod, a wave will transfer down there. Here, I'll show you. And that's pretty neat. Now, the rods are moving as they, and they're twisting as they go. So the rods are actually moving as a torsional wave, like torque. But I'm look, calling this a transverse wave because I'm looking at just the dots on the end of the rods. The dots were just moving up and down. And that is what is the definition of a transverse wave. A longitudinal wave, here I have these little carts and there's magnets that are opposing. Give a little shove here and the wave transfers down. And waves transfer energy. Matter is not actually moving from here to here. The matter was just moving up and down, but the energy was traveling down. Same thing here. The matter just moved back and forth, and, but the energy traveled down the length of the end. And when energy is moving from one place to another, we say that energy is propagating. And that could be a vocabulary word. The propagation of energy is the spreading out of energy as it goes from one place to another. And then another vocabulary word would be the word medium. And that's just the material the wave is passing through. So here we saw the wave go from left to right. The medium was just moving up and down. Those little dots were just moving up and down. So we have this prefix trans, and this is what we have to make the difference between transverse versus longitudinal. Trans means across. So if the wave is traveling left to right, the medium was moving across that or perpendicular to. The longitudinal wave traveled from left to right, but the medium just moved back and forth parallel to the wave and the prefix long makes me think of a long or parallel to. So the medium was moving parallel to the direction of the wave. And more vocabulary, one is just that we have, um, if, if this is the ocean with no waves, this is where the ocean would be, and that's just the typical position, the home line, the normal, lots of different words for that. But um, if I were to ask, you to point to the crest of a wave, I think you would have no trouble calling that the crest. Uh, similarly, if I asked you to point to the trough of a wave, probably down there. Okay, And with longitudinal waves, we don't have crests and trough. We have areas that are pressed together. They're compressed. So we call it a compression. And we have areas of the wave that are more spread out. Uh, the, the medium is more spread out. And when things are spread out, they're rare, or we call it a rarefaction. Another vocabulary or part of a wave we need to look at is the amplitude of a wave. You might think the amplitude is the distance from top all the way down to the bottom, but it is not. It is just how high, it above, how high above it is from where it typically would be. So if there's no waves in the ocean, the crest was some distance above where it typically is. And that would be the amplitude of the wave, abbreviated with letter A. And because it's a distance or a height, we measure it in meters. Uh, we could also measure from that typical spot down to a trough, and that would also be the amplitude of the wave. So what is the amplitude of a longitudinal wave going to be? Well, it has to do with how compressed or how rarefied it is. And if air is compressed or spread out, it's going to change the pressure in the air. So the amplitude for a longitudinal wave would be a unit of pressure, which is 
pascals. So here's an animation that I did that uh, shows how amplitude is related to longitudinal waves. If these are individual air molecules, we can see that some areas have compressions, other areas have rarefactions, but this area is very compressed and this is not so compressed. So this, if this is a wave moving through air, this would be a loud sound with lots of energy, and this would be a fainter, a softer sound with less energy. But the amplitude is measuring the energy of that wave measured in Pascals. So when we play the animation, we can see that a wave is moving from left to right here. The wave is moving from left to right, but the individual molecules that make up the medium are just moving back and forth, left and right, along the direction of the wave, a longitudinal wave. And then another vocabulary word would, be just, would just be wavelength. Okay, And no big challenges here. Wavelength is just the length of a wave. Okay, Don't forget that one. It's, it's an easy one to remember. Uh, we abbreviate that with a Greek letter lambda, and we measure it in units of meters. Okay, so let me just say that clearly again. Wavelength is the length of a wave, of, of just one wave, and it's the distance, or measured in meters. We do use the Greek letter lambda here, um, because L is used for other things, but uh, the Greek letter lambda sounds like an L for length. Another way we could remember that symbol, it kind of looks like how you would measure the distance from one crest to the next crest. You could measure that with your uh, hand like that, and it makes the shape of the Greek letter lambda. So we measure the wavelength in meters from one crest to the next crest. That's just one complete cycle or one complete wave. We could measure it from trough to trough. That's also one complete wave or from where it's going down to where it goes down again, or from where it starts going up until it starts going up again. One complete wave. And likewise with longitudinal waves, we could measure it from compression to compression, or from rarefaction to rarefaction, but that would be the wavelength. In this case, it was four centimeters or 0 0.04 meters. Couple more vocabulary words period, and frequency. If you looked at simple harmonic motion, you are familiar with those two words. If not, period is just the time that it takes for one complete wave to pass by. Okay, so here is the wave and here is a clock. So we're going to count off seconds. One, two, three, four seconds for that whole complete wave to pass by. So the period with a capital T, four seconds for one wave to pass by, or just four seconds was the period. Frequency is the reciprocal of that. Instead of seconds per wave, it's waves per second. So in one, it, it only had one wave pass in four seconds. So that is the same thing as 0.25 waves in one second, just dividing that out waves per second is measured in a unit called hertz. And if one is seconds per wave and the other is waves per second, period and frequency will be reciprocals of each other. Now let's see if we can develop an equation that will relate how fast a wave is traveling. And we're going to make the analogy with how fast a train is traveling. So let's put a little reference point here and keep track of how many cars go by. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten cars go by. And if I look at the video here, it's uh, 7.26 seconds. So ten cars passed by in 7.26 seconds. And I divide that out, that's 1.38 cars per second. We're trying to figure out how fast that train was going. So what else would we need to know to figure out how far that train travels every second? Well, if we knew the length of the, each car, 
we knew that 10 cars went by in this many seconds. If I knew the length of each car, I could take how many cars passed every second and multiply it by how many meters there are per car. Cars would cancel and I would get meters per second, which is how fast it's going. Well, the analogy here is that the cars are very much like individual waves. And so here's one wave, another wave, another wave. And this equation here says velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength. So how many cars pass by every second is like frequency, waves per second. Wavelength would be the length of a wave or how many meters there are per wave. Waves would cancel and we get a velocity in meters per second. So V equals F lambda. Velocity equals frequency times wavelength. If we rearrange that and solve for wavelength, uh, we see an equation that we have on our equation sheets. And just simple practice with that. If I hit middle C on the piano, there is a string back there that's vibrating back and forth 256 times a second. Sound travels around 342 meters per second. So velocity divided by frequency would give me the length of the waves that are coming through the air off of that piano key or the string. This laser is emitting light that has a wavelength of 532 nanometers or 532 times 10 to the negative nine meters. And light waves travel, well, the speed of light, 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So I can plug the numbers into the equation and solve for frequency, and we get a really high frequency that the waves are jiggling back and forth at in the light. One of the interesting things about waves is it does not matter the wavelength or the frequency, they will travel at the same rate. So as we look at these two different waves traveling down the length of my medium, this one had a very short wavelength this had a much longer wavelength, but they're traveling at exactly the same speed. So changing the frequency of a wave, I'll just show that here again. This had a really long wavelength and a short wavelength. They were both traveling at the same velocity. So as long as we're on a particular medium, like waves on my demonstration here or waves on a string, or waves going through the air, as long as they're all on the same medium, all those waves travel at the same velocity. So changing the frequency would not change the velocity. Changing the frequency would change the wavelength. In fact, because that is constant, we see that wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional to each other. When one goes up, the other goes down. And I can show that here. So this wavelength is twice the wavelength of this. They're traveling at the same velocity, but if we count how many waves go by there every second and compare them to how many waves go by there every second, here only half of a wave passed every second, and here one whole wave passed every second. This one had twice the frequency of this one. So because the velocity was constant, if you double the frequency, it will have the wavelength. So if I measure this, it's about eight centimeters, and I measure this, it's about four centimeters. Going from here to here, double the frequency, but going from here to here, halved the wavelength. And if we really speed this up and make this more like sounds we would hear on a piano, uh, this sound here, is 256 hertz. If literally 256 waves pass by our ears every second, we would hear this tone of middle C on the piano. If we doubled the frequency like this, that sound we're hearing is also C, but it's C an octave higher. So pitch and frequency are really the same thing. A higher pitch 
is a higher frequency. And then let's say we have a guitar here and we have waves on that happen on these strings. What are some variables that it could affect the velocity of the wave? We're actually changing the property of the medium. Okay, if I don't change anything, all waves would travel the same speed on that string. But if I change that string, I can change the velocity, which will change its frequency. Well, these little knobs here is how you tune the guitar. It changes the tension on the string. How much force is through the length of that string affects how much, how fast those waves travel back and forth on that string. And then the, you may not have guessed this one, but linear density is the other variable that would affect how fast waves travel on a string like this. See how this one has a lot of mass in a given length? And this string is very thin. It doesn't have near as much mass in a given length. So you don't need to know this equation, but it is just there for you to see. Uh, velocity is going to be the square root of the tension divided by the linear density. And linear density is just how much mass there is per length of string. But you could calculate how fast to make those waves and the wavelength of those waves to produce the frequency of the waves that you want to hear. All right, now this animation that I created here um, was a little inaccurate. I need to like clean it up a little bit because these molecules aren't just sitting there waiting to be collided into other molecules. They're moving all over the place, like in this picture over here on the left. So those um, little air molecules are banging into each other and then a wave would pass through here. The molecules would be closer together at a rare fact, a compression and they'd be further apart in a rare faction, but they're all moving more than just what I'm showing here. So what's really going on is kind of a combination of those two pictures, but it would be pretty tough to animate that in a way that you could see. Well, with that in mind, let's see what determines the speed of sound. How fast can sound travel through air? Does the density of the air matter? Meaning if you're at sea level where the air is real dense or you're on top of Pikes Peak, 14,110, some places say 14,115, but um, the air is a lot less dense. The molecules are a lot further spread apart. So um, is it going to affect the uh, speed of those waves? Well, one thing I forgot to mention here is temperature is directly proportional to the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So if these molecules had a higher temperature, they would be moving with more kinetic energy. They'd be moving faster. And as they cooled down, they would also slow down. So how fast waves can propagate from one place to another is how quickly they can close the gap between there. Well, the higher the temperature, the faster they're moving, so the faster the sound's going to travel. But it does not matter the density, because here these molecules are close together, because it's a lot of high density at sea level, and here the molecules are further apart. But what I'm saying here is that because they're at the same temperature, those molecules are traveling the same speed, and even though there were more molecules, the overall propagation of that wave was the same velocity. If it was colder, you know, 20 degrees at sea level or 20 degrees at 14,110 feet, the molecules are going to be traveling slower between each one, but the wave still propagates at the same speed. Okay, all right. Now we're going to get into a um, brand new area here, not with car crashes, but with waves interfering with each other. One idea is that matter is really lousy at trying to occupy the same place at the same time as other matter. So two cars trying to occupy the same place at the same time, it's a mess and it doesn't work out so well. But energy can. Energy can occupy the same place at the same time as other energy. And light is a form of energy. So if I had this projector shining a beach scene and this projector shining a sunset scene, 
the energy from that projector can just pass right through the energy from this one and emerge on the other side. What we want to do is to look at the intersection. What's happening when those two energies are at the same place at the same time? Well, you get a little beach scene and you get a little sunset scene. You'll see a little bit of both. And I said earlier, but I want to reinforce this idea that with a transverse wave, what part of the wave exhibits the energy? Well, we have to remember that energy is the ability to do work and work was force times distance. So if this wave passes by and lifts this boat up, the wave is doing work on that boat. The further distance it moved, the more work was done, the more energy the wave must have had. So the energy of a transverse wave is found in the amplitude of the wave. And with longitudinal waves, we said this had more energy than this one, but if I had like a wall here or a window and a compression hit that window, well, that's high pressure. Since pressure is force over area, that greater pressure is going to put more force on that window and actually move it backwards. It will cause the window to vibrate. But more pressure is more force, more force, could move at a greater distance, but the wave had more energy. So the energy in a longitudinal wave is found in its amplitude as well. So if I had a string or a spring or a wave motion demonstrator, it could not be at those two locations at one time, but the waves that are on that spring could. So what is it going to look like when those two waves are at the same place at the same time? Well, it's going to be very similar to just adding positive and negative numbers. Two positive numbers added together result in an even bigger positive number. A positive number added to a negative number is going to make that positive number a little smaller. If this was negative and this was positive, the result will be the same but negative. And if they're both negative, you get something even more negative. So right in through here, those two waves are both positive. In through here, those two waves are both negative. Uh, in through here, one is positive and one is negative. And also in through here, one is positive and one is negative. So here's how we're going to look at what the wave looks like. We're just going to draw in a bunch of reference lines, to, enough to get an idea of what's going on. And then I'm going to look at the amplitude of the red. That's where the energy is. And I'm going to add it to the amplitude of the blue. That's where its energy is. So I'm just thinking of these as positive and negative numbers. I'll do the first one. 0 plus 0 is 0. Well, that was easy. Okay, but let's, because in through here, both amplitudes are positive, it's like this one, the red one is up at 5, and this blue one is up maybe at 4. You add them together, and you get something way up there at 9. That was easy. Okay. So I'm just combining the amplitudes. Red had positive amplitude, blue had positive amplitude, so I just stack them on top of each other. Stack them on top, stack them on top, okay? And same thing in through here, same thing in through here. Now we have to be a little careful. This blue one, let's say, is up at positive eight, and maybe this red one is down at negative one. Well, positive eight and negative one would bring it down a little bit at positive seven. Okay, so here again, this is a positive number and this is a negative number, but this was more negative. So when I put those like that, it's gonna bring it down to there. Okay, and I'm, and I'm taking the red and I'm subtracting the blue. But the blue is negative and the red is negative, so now we're gonna get something even more negative. Okay, all the way through here, I'm just adding the amplitude of the blue to the amplitude of the red. And it's really easy when they're both negative or both positive. Okay, the challenge comes when this one is positive and this one is negative. But if this is more negative than that's positive. So we're just going to get a little less. We're going to get that much less from where it was at. 
This one's pretty darn close, but the blue is a little more negative. And we're going to bring this up here and subtract. And then that was zero, so we're just going to get that there. So these two waves can be on the same place at the same time, but the wave is just going to follow the resultant of those, which the medium is going to be looking like this white wave that comes through here like this. Really tall, where they both were positive, really low, where they both were negative, and not so big when one was positive and one was negative. All right, I think every example you're going to have to do is where you're just combining two waves that are stationary, just like I've done. But waves transfer energy. If a wave is not transferring energy, it's not a wave, meaning these waves are in motion. This red wave could be moving to the right, and the blue wave could be moving to the left. So a moment later, these waves are going to be in a slightly different position. So this hand here is going to make a wave, and this hand here is going to make a wave. And watch what happens as they go. I have this in slow motion. so You can see what's going on. This wave is traveling to the left. This wave is traveling to the right. Now they start to overlap, and they keep moving. And then finally, in the end, they get all the way back to over there. Maybe it's hard to see, so let's do this again. But this time, I'm going to show um, the resultant of these two waves. we got this blue wave moving here, this red wave moving here. Watch as they start to interfere. Okay, there, there. And then in the very end, they get all the way back over here. And that blue wave is now on the left, and the red wave is now on the right. That's fantastic. Okay. Because it's moving, it's a little hard to see. So let's again look at the interference of these two waves. This wave is not overlapping with this one, so no interference yet. The crest of this one is starting to overlap with the trough of this one, and we get interference. And when one is positive and the other is negative, we get what's called destructive interference. It tears it down. But you can see that the medium here is just going to kind of be in between here and there. As we step these even further, this part of the blue has not yet overlapped with the red, but this part of the red is overlapping with this part of the blue. And again, the medium is going to be the resultant of the interference of those two waves, which was destructive interference. Now the wave has moved a little bit further to the left and the red has moved a little bit further to the right. Here we have crest on crest and we get an even bigger crest. Here we have trough on trough, we get an even bigger trough. Uh, that is building up and we call that constructive interference. They keep on passing. Now this one is over here and we get destructive interference again. No interference over here and no interference here. Only when they're overlapping, you get interference. But finally, it's over there on the end. And that is a little bit about interference of waves and vocabulary related to that.